Amen and amen. Avinu Malkinu, our Father King, we just thank you that you love us so much. You even want to put your name upon us. Father, I just pray this morning everyone would have ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to understand what you're trying to tell us for our day in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right. A big Shabbat Shalom to everybody. I love the Sea of Galilee. How many of you have been to the Sea of Galilee on it? Yeah. How many of you want to be on the Sea of Galilee? Yeah. Okay, the Torah portion this morning is a more. Okay, and what does that word mean? Say. To speak or to say, to publish, right? Well, okay, say a more. Now say Amorites. Same root word, same word. The Amorites are those who speak, who publish, things like that. And if you remember when Abraham was knocked out and the flame went through the sacrifice parts, God talks to him about how his descendants will be, you know, slaves. And, but it'll be a while because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So God is waiting for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full for us. And who are the Amorites? It's the publishers, the media. The iniquity of the media is getting full. That's where we're at today. But Amor means to speak or say. And the Torah portion today is all about sanctification for the priesthood. Last week's Torah portion was all about uh, sanctification for the individual. So last week, it was all about coming against sexual immorality, uh, child sacrifice, okay? Well, we're going to tie all these things together uh, right now. But the, the, in our Torah portion now, what God is saying, look at Leviticus 21, verse 1 and 2. It says, And the Lord said to Moses to speak more to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, There shall none be defiled for the dead among his people, except for his relatives that are near to him, mother, father, son, daughter, brother. So the priests were held to a higher degree than the rest of Israel. And then the high priest was held to an even higher degree. For uh, example, when it comes to being defiled for the dead, the common Israelite, you know, there was one standard. For the priests, there was another standard right here. They can't go to a, f a friend's funeral. They can't go there. They can only do it for their immediately immediate family. But the high priest can't do it even for immediate family. Okay, so there's different levels of sanctification. And now they're talking about sanctification of the dead. Uh, let me see. I may see if I'm going to go into... Let's see. For uh, example, do you remember the story of the Good Samaritan? And who was passing this person who was half dead? The priests. Well, the priests, they're saying, I'm following Torah. I don't want to get anywhere near this guy because he's half dead. If he dies, I'm in trouble. You following me? So when you understand, they were looking at it, though, from a legal, legalistic standpoint. This is why you can't turn Torah into legalism which is what some people do. I mean, the, the Christians, I believe, when they say Torah is legalism, they don't understand the word Torah. But Messianics, there's some of them that will take the Torah and turn it into legalism. And uh, here we see this is what the, the priests were doing back then. But you can see they're following scripture. I don't want to get near him. I'm, then I'll be defiled. But see, that's, God wants us to go look at our heart. Okay, so can you imagine? Here they are all camped out at Mount Sinai, uh, and how many of you know people died all during the wilderness, the 40 years wandering? Okay, well, let's look at Leviticus 21, 16 through 18. Here, the Lord says to Moses, saying, speak to Aaron, saying, whoever he is of your seed in their generation that has any blemish, he cannot approach to offer the bread, for whatever man he be that has a blemish, he shall 
not approach. Now, the priest could still get his portion, okay? He just got uh, off of work duty, okay? So he has a blemish that doesn't necessarily mean bad. For example, if he's blind. If one of Aaron's sons is blind, do you think it is good or bad that he doesn't have to walk around fires and trip over, uh, you know, sheep, okay? Hey, if God is doing the priest almost a favor if he's blind, so he's not walking around the fires and trying to do things, okay? So it's not necessarily a bad thing, but, we're to, but we can see it's obviously bad to be blind. All right. Uh, now, once healed, they could. For example, if they had a broken foot or a broken hand, they couldn't work. But that's out of kindness, too, all right? But they could go back to work if the blemish got healed. So let's look at Leviticus 22, verse 31 and 32. It says, therefore, you shall keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord. You shall not profane my holy name, but I will be made holy among the children of Israel. I am the Lord who makes you holy. So who makes you holy? That's right. Nobody else makes you holy, only the Lord. I mean, some denominations will try to make you holy by doing certain things, but that doesn't make you holy. Uh, the Lord is the one who makes you holy. All right? Now, when it came to the sacrifices, we just read the priest had to be without blemish. Okay? Well, guess what? We also know the sacrifice had to be without blemish. They can't offer a lamb that was blind either or a sheep that was blind. Look at this in Leviticus 22, 20. But whatever has a blemish, you shall not offer, for it shall not be acceptable for you. Okay, you got to remember, this is roughly 1300 to 1500 BC when this is going on. And he says, clear back then, don't you be offering any defective animals. It's like, I remember as a kid, there was a group that would come by and collect canned goods. I don't know if they're happening in your neighborhood, food for the poor or whatever, and, and always try to tell mom, give them, the, give them the spinach, give them the lima beans, give them, you know. Uh, you know, I'm being kind, but I'm getting rid of the stuff I hate, not the stuff I love, you know. So uh, here we find in Malachi, you have to remember, Malachi is like a thousand years later. And look what, remember, Malachi is after the destruction of the temple. Ezra, Nehemiah, rebuilding the temple. They're just now starting the sacrifices again. But most of these people never saw the first temple. They, this is a whole new generation out of Babylon. And look what it says in Malachi 1, 8 and 9. They're offering defective animals on God's altar. He says, when you offer the blind for sacrifice, isn't that evil? And when you offer the lame and the sick, isn't that evil? Present it now to your governor. Will he be pleased with you? Or will he accept your person, says the Lord of hosts? Now, please entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us with this. Will he accept any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Wow. Well, the thing is this. The priest who was supposed to be unblemished was also responsible in not accepting blemished animals from the congregation. So the very fact that Malachi is talking about this it's one thing to bring it. It's another thing to accept it. Things are completely out of order here. Well, here's the thing. How many of you know we're supposed to be kings and priests? Okay. How many of you also know we're also the sacrificial animal? <laughs> we're, we're both. This is why, look at Romans 12, 1. It says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, except unto God, which is your reasonable service. So not only are you supposed to be unblemished as a priest, you're to be unblemished as the sacrifice. So there's no getting out of not being holy. As a matter of fact, look at Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. It says, husbands, love your wives, even as... Christ also loved the church, gave himself for it. We found out last week he's not just the Lamb of God, he's the Ram of God. He's the one who jumped in front of us and took the bullet for us, basically. Okay, so it says here we're to offer ourselves. So we are the priest as well as the sacrifice, and we have to be holy and acceptable to God, and that's only reasonable. 
Now look at Ephesians 5, 25 through uh, 27. Husband, love your wives as the Messiah loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by what? That is why I give you lots of word. I don't give you one verse and then talk about baseball, okay, for the next 45 minutes. I want you to get washed by the word. I want you to hear the word because the word is what cleanses us, cleanses our mind. You don't want to hear what I have to say. You want to hear what God has to say. So I'm going to tell you what he said. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. How can, and this is from the New Testament. How can anyone think in the New Testament that holiness has gone away? It says uh, in no place in Hebrews, without holiness, no one's going to see the Lord. All right. In Ephesians, when it says no one should have any spot, wrinkle, or blemishes, what is that talking about? I mean, how many of you know he's definitely speaking allegorically? I mean, obviously, if you physical have a, physically have some blemish like I have, that doesn't mean, oh, you're not going to heaven because you have a physical blemish. All right, so when he says he wants a church without spot, wrinkle, or blemish, how many of you believe that's what he wants? So how many of you know what you have to get rid of? What is he talking about when he says spots, wrinkles, and blemishes? That's what we have to go back to Torah. The Torah tells us what spots are. It tells us what blemishes are. So let's go uh, jump into the Torah in our Torah portion. And it says in Leviticus 21, 19 through 21, it lists the blemishes. A blind man, lame, whoever has a flat nose, anything superfluous, a man that's broken footed, broken handed, a crook back, a midget, whoever has a blemish in his eye or has scurvy, is scabbed or has his stones broken. No one that has a blemish of a seed of Aaron, a priest will come near to offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire as a blemish. He shall not come nigh to offer the bread of his God. Okay, so when you think of Ephesians, he wanted to present to himself a church without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. We just got done reading the 12 blemishes in Leviticus 21, 16 through 22, and I'm going to go through each one of these from an allegorical standpoint that Paul was referring to. Blindness. What do we know about blindness? Well, I'm going to talk first about the church with blind eyes. Let's look at Revelation 3, 17 and 18. He's speaking to the church. And because the church says, I'm rich. Prosperity doctrine is what it's all about. And increased with goods. I have need of nothing. And you don't even know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, and blind and naked. I counsel you to buy me gold tried in the fire, that you can be rich, white raiment, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness doesn't appear, and then anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may not be blind anymore. Okay, so we see a church with blind eyes. Uh, let's look at the, from an individual standpoint, look at Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 9. According as God's divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. It's about knowing him, not knowing about him. That has called us to glory and virtue, whereby we are given exceedingly great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. This is what we're talking about, the yard. This is what it's all about. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temperance, temperance, patience, patience, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness, charity or love. Now look at this. For if these things be in you and they abound, they make you that you'll neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever lacks these things is what? If you lack these things, you're blind and you can't see. You've forgotten that you were purged from your old sins. So what causes spiritual blindness to people? Where, Like the Pharisees, you blind Pharisees. Blindness is caused by people who aren't doing these things. They're after the flesh, not after the spirit. But it's not just blind eyes. We can have a blind mind. 
Look at 2 Corinthians 3, 13 through 14. Not as Moses that put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not look upon them to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded. Until this day remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Tanakh, which veil is done away in the Messiah. So here it's not just blind eyes. You can have a blind mind. Israel mind has been blinded to who the Messiah is at this time. But it's not just Israel. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 through 4. If our gospel is hid, it is hid to those who are lost and whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them who don't believe, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Messiah, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Well, guess what? Blindness in the heart and mind has happened to the Gentiles. Look at Ephesians 4, 17 and 18. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you henceforth don't walk as the other Gentiles walk in the vanity of your mind, having the understanding darkened, alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Wow. So here we can be blinded in our eyes, blinded in our heart, blinded in our mind. Uh, and the only way we can cure that, this spiritual blindness is curable. You have to go back and do the other things that it said. Now, what about being lame? What was that referring to? Uh, lame is someone whose uh, legs are disabled or of unequal lengths. Both those things uh, happened to my dad. I told you guys about an accident that my dad was in a long time ago when he was lame for my whole life uh, while I was about 18 months uh, one of the stories, I told you I was going to finish the story of my dad several weeks ago, and I didn't finish it. So I'll just finish it right now real quick when I'm thinking of being lame. If you remember, he was in that real bad car accident in the van, and uh, one leg was two inches shorter than the other leg. I don't know if I told you that. But anyway, he had a built-up shoe, which was very expensive he had to replace. Well, this is back in 1957. And he had to have a metal rod straight down. He had no hip, no knee, so his leg was either going to be forever sticking straight out and he could never stand or straight down and he could never bend his knee or move a hip and he'd always have to stand. Okay, so after science, medicine got better, they had artificial hips. And they wanted to put an artificial hip in so he could swing his leg. And uh, the doctors did that, and he said, as long as you're doing that, can you shorten or can you lengthen my bad leg too, two inches? Can you lengthen that metal rod two inches so that I don't have to wear this built-up shoe and I won't be lame? The doctor said, no, but we can cut your good leg off and shorten it two inches. He goes, let's do that. So they go in and they cut open the side of his leg. They cut out two inches of his femur put it back together with nuts and bolts in a brace so it would fuse back together, sewed them back up. A couple months later, he fell and broke it. They had to reopen it again, <laughs> take everything out, refix it, rebolt it, and put the nuts in. And then about a year later, they reopened them a third time to take all the nuts and the bolts out, and now he's fine. Of course, he's dead now, but I'm just saying back then. <laughs> but anyway, I forgot to finish that crazy story. Okay, so lame basically means having unequal measures. How many of you know if someone tells you something and you go, well, that's really a lame excuse? You know what I'm talking about? We've used this terminology today. Uh, look at 2 Samuel 4.4. Here we see Saul's son Jonathan uh, had a son who was lame. All right, but look at this. This is important. He was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. His nurse took him up, fled, came to pass, and she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. Do you know we can cause blemishes in other people? She did not handle this kid correctly, and now he became lame because of them. We have to realize not only do we have blemishes we might need to get rid of, we might need to tell people we're sorry that we caused them a blemish. Now look at Job. Job is my hero. Here in 29, 12 through 15, look what Job says. Because I delivered the poor that cried, and I delivered the fatherless, and him that had no one to help him. The blessing of him that was ready to perish came upon me. 
and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My judgment was as a robe and a diadem. I was eyes to the blind and feet was I to the lame. So the first two blemishes are people who are blind and lame. And how many of you know that happens in the church all the time, but are we going to be the people that I go, you're blind, you're lame, or are we going to be the people that assist those who are blind and assist those who are lame? You following me? We're not to be judging. Uh, you can, you'll probably recognize, oh, well, this person is spiritually blind or this person is spiritually lame, but guess what? Your job now is to help them. When you look at all the trouble Job went through and yet he still found time to help other people, that's amazing. Proverbs 26, 7. The legs of the lame are not equal. Okay, so right here is telling us that lameness has to do with inequality. But then he also says, so is a parable in the mouth of fools. Look at Ezekiel. Here it is, 18, 23 through 25. This will nail it down. God says, have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he would return from his ways and live. But when the righteous turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? All of his righteousness that he has done will not be mentioned. In his trespass that he trespassed and his sin that he sinned, and them shall he die. Yet you're saying the way of the Lord is not equal. Here now, O Israel, is not my way equal or not your ways unequal. And so sometimes we want to tell God how he's to judge and govern, and we don't think he's fair. And God is saying, no, 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 I am the one who's true. I, it's you whose ways are unequal. Do we have any inequality in the justice system? There's inequality everywhere in all of our political systems and justice systems, which is why I believe God is going to be judging. But you know what's amazing? Most of Messiah's miracles were to the blind and the lame. That's who he healed. Okay, the third one, whoever has a flat nose. What in the world does that mean, having a flat nose? I will tell you. Okay, first off, how many of you know the Song of Songs is about the Messiah and the bride, right? Okay, let's look at chapter 7, verse 4. The groom is speaking to the bride, and he says, Your neck is like a tower of ivory, your eyes like the fish pools in Heshbon by the gate of Bath Rabbin, and your nose is like the tower of Lebanon <laughs> that looks toward Damascus. How many of you would appreciate someone telling you your nose is like the tower of Lebanon, <laughs> Okay, so we see here from a spiritual standpoint, the bride has a big nose and a blemish is having a flat nose. Well, how many of you ever heard the term, I smell a rat? I smell a rat. Something smells fishy. What he's talking about is someone who has no spiritual discernment. That's what the flat nose means. It means you have no spiritual discernment. Let's look at this. Uh, Job again, 27, verse 1, 3. Moreover, Job continued his parable, and he said, As God lives, who has taken away my judgment, and the Almighty, who's vexed my soul, and while my breath is within me, and the Spirit of God is where? And the Spirit of God is what gives us discernment. That's how this ties together. You see that in Hebrews 5, 12 through 14. It says, When the time comes that you ought to be teachers... You have need that one teach you again the very first principles of the oracles of God, and you become such as in need of milk and not strong meat. Everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. He's just a baby. Strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to have what? Yes. To discern. You can smell it. You know. Uh, and then the next one, uh, let's just see. Oh, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 14. It says, as it is written, eye is not seen, ear is not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for them that love him, but God has revealed them to us by his spirit. Because look at this, the spirit churches everything, the deep things of God. For what does man know except the spirit of man that's in him? Even so, the things of God knows no man but the spirit of God. And now we've received not the spirit of this world, but the spirit which is of God, that we can know those things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak not in words, which man's wisdom teaches, but by the Holy Ghost who teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. 
But look at this. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Neither can he even know them because they are what? They're spiritually discerned. Okay, so sometimes if you're out there witnessing and you're beating someone over the head and they don't get it, you can see why they don't get it. They don't get it. This is why you have to rely on God working with you. And then the next thing, speaking of that, is a priest who has anything superfluous. That refers to like an extra finger, an extra toe, or adding to what God has created. This is why in Deuteronomy 4.2, God says, don't add to the word I command you and don't diminish from it that you can keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Same thing in Proverbs 35 through 6. Every word of God, we know Yeshua is the word of God, but every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those that put their trust in him. And then here's where it says, don't you be adding to his words unless he reproves you and you be found a liar. And that's why in Revelation 22, 18 through 19, same thing. Don't be adding. If you add to God's word, he's going to add the plagues to you. Okay, the next one is a broken foot. What does a broken foot speak of spiritually? It's your walk. Your walk is all messed up. You don't have the ability to stand. Uh, Isaiah 65, 1 and 2, God says, I'm sought of them that didn't even ask for me. I'm found of those that weren't even looking for me. And I said, behold me, behold me to a nation that was not called by my name. And then he says, I spread out my hands all day to a rebellious people which walk in a way that is not good. So when it speaks of a priest with a blemish of a broken foot, it's, I believe it's speaking of someone who is walking in a way that's not good. Look at Jeremiah 10, 23. Oh, Lord, I know that the way of man is not even in himself. It's not in man that walks to direct his steps. We kind of think, well, I'm going to be my own man. I'm going to do my own thing. Hey, you're going to get off course. That's why in Psalms 119, 103 through 105, it says, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. You're, through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We don't get lost if we keep the word of God a lamp in front of our feet. The next thing is a broken hand. Well, that talks about your works, your ability to handle things. That's why 2 Corinthians 4, 2, it talks about those who handle the word of God deceitfully. Jeremiah 2, 8, it talks about the priests of all people who are supposed to know the Torah. The priests didn't even say, where is the Lord? They didn't even know he was gone. Those that are handling the law don't even know me. So they know the law, but they don't know the king who created the laws. That's what happens to legalists. Legalists are Torah people who don't know the king. They only know his words. Okay? Now, Matthew 7, 21 and 22. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever does the will of my Father is in heaven. Many are going to say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, in your name cast out devils, and your name done many wonderful works? And what is he going to say? I don't even know you. Okay? Titus 1.16. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. Wow, you can do all these good works, but you're denying him because the works become all about you. I don't have time to go through all 12 blemishes, went through half of them. But anyway, I have a whole teaching on that uh, in our store. Okay, with that said, let's stand. Ran out of time. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to take a break, uh, and then we'll have worship, and then we'll go back to Corinthians. Avinu Makenu, our Father King, we just thank you so much for your word. It's your word that cleanses us. We want to be cleansed. Your word is alive. Your word is living. Uh, your true is always cleansing us. And so we just thank you, Father, that we can just sit under your word, hear it direct from you, Father, direct all of our steps. It's not in us to direct our steps. We need you to lead us and to guide us. And Father, I thank you for all those that are live streaming from all over the world, all those that are here right now, Father, that plant the seeds of your word throughout the whole world. It's amazing to me how many countries are watching live right now and how many cities. And I just thank you, Lord, for all those all over that sow into your ministry Father, and taking the light of your Torah to the nations. In Yeshua's name, amen.
together. Blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. Okay. Got some kind of interesting things for everybody today. Uh, again, we're talking about the life and adventures of Shaliak Shaul. Most of it, he grew up in Turkey. Tarsus is in Turkey. And his, most of his travels was throughout Turkey and Greece. And today we're talking about Corinth in the yellow. You can see that in the far corner in yellow, Corinth. Now what we have to... Uh, do is tell Jill my battery's dying because this thing's not plugged in right. Okay. Something's not hooked up right. Okay, so as we're going here, what do we know about the Corinthians in particular? If you had to sum the Corinthians up, because you want to look at the big picture. When he's writing to the Corinthians, what we find about them is this. They are a bunch of babies. They're whining. They're crying. We want our milk. And uh, babies can be cute, but when adults are acting like babies, it loses its cuteness. The cuteness kind of goes away. Well, that's the Corinthians. So you got to understand when you're reading it, who he's talking to. As a matter of fact, let's look at 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1 and 2. It says, And I, brethren, cannot speak to you, about spiritual things. Why? Because they're spiritually discerned and they're still babies. They haven't developed a nose like the Tower of Lebanon. He says, you're still carnal, even as babies in the Messiah. He says, I got to give you milk and not meat because you were then unable to take it. And even now you're still not able because you are still operating in the flesh. You're carnal. That's why they're babies. Remember, they were all Gentiles, okay? So he's working with newborn, literally born-again babies. Uh, He says, when there is envying and divisions among you, are you not still walking after the way of flesh, even as natural men? Isn't that amazing how that ties into the Torah portion this morning? Exactly. So let's jump to 1 Corinthians 6. This is where we're picking up in this chapter. How is it? that if any one of you has a cause at law against another, he takes it before a Gentile judge and not before the saints. Is it not certain that the saints will be the judges of the world? If then the world will be judged by you, are you unable to give a decision about the littlest things? Is it not certain that we are to be judges even of angels? How much more than of the things of this life? Can you imagine judging how well your angel took care of you? Or just imagine the angels are going to be judged. Okay. Now, here, where does Paul get this thinking from? Why are you going to the Gentiles? He gets that from the Torah in Exodus 21.1. What they say when God is delivering the commandments on Mount Sinai. This is Exodus 19, 20, 21, 22. God says to Moses, now these are the laws which you are to put before them. Who is them? Them is not the non-Jews or Gentiles. The them that they put the laws before are going to be the judges of Israel who are Jewish. Or, and so the point is this. He's saying, look, we need to you know, put, you know, take care of ourselves. Don't you be taking this to a Gentile judge. Now, obviously, it's a different day we live in now. But do any of you know any judges that uh, don't judge equally? They're lame judges. Okay. Well, I can give you some great examples. Okay. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 6, 4 through 7. If then there are questions to be judged in connection with the things of this life, Why do you put them in the hands of those who have no position in the church? I say this to put you to shame. Is there not among you one wise man who may be able to give a decision between his brothers? But a brother who has a cause at law against another takes it before Gentile judges. 
More than this, it is not to your credit to have causes at law with one another at all. Why not put up with the wrong? Why not undergo loss? You know, it's amazing. Some people, their, their life is based on suing people. I mean, that's just the way some people are, you know. But it's like, why are you whining about little things? If you're going to whine, at least make it a big thing. Don't make it a little thing. Now, look at 1 Corinthians 6, 8 through 11. Again, he's speaking to baby Gentiles. And let's see. 6, 8 through 11. Nay, but ye yourselves do wrong. You defraud. And that your own brethren. Or know you not that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? It says, don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with men, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But. You were washed, you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach and in the spirit of our God. Okay, now when he says that they've been washed and clean, okay, that tells you they're not to return back to that lifestyle. But the other thing is, he's not referring to a single infraction. Okay, so if, if you do one of these one time, that doesn't mean, okay, you're condemned to hell. Okay, you, you also can be washed and cleansed, but you're not washed and cleansed when you continue to do it. That's the problem with the sloppy, greasy grace in the church today. They say you can sin all you want and the blood will just continue to wash you. You have fun sinning. And, you know, it doesn't work that way. Romans 2, 3 through 6. It says, do you suppose, O oh man... You who judge those who practice such things, and yet you do them yourself, that you're going to escape the judgment of God? You know, a lot of times, and you see this too with the preachers that have been taken down on TV for different reasons, the ones that point the finger the most are usually the ones that are doing the infraction that they talk about the most. They're, they're trying to smoke screen it. Don't look at me. Do you presume on the riches of his kindness? And the forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to stop doing it. So don't think you're going to get forgiven if you continue in your sin. The blood of Jesus doesn't wash you when you still have 10 matches as an arsonist. You've got to put the matches down. It says, but because of your hard and impenitent hearts, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to everyone according to his work. That's his work in you, not your work for him. Your work for him needs to be his work being done through you. That is the work you want to do for him. You don't want to do your own works for him. You want to allow him to work through you, his works, if that makes sense. Okay, 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 14. A lot of Bibles have this wrong. Uh, it's supposed to be like it is here, where in parentheses it says, it has been said. Everything is allowed for me. Some places it doesn't have that, and they sound like Paul is saying, I can do whatever I want. That's not what he's saying. He is saying that it is said, everything, I can do whatever I want. Boy, we hear that in the church today. But even so, not everything is good for me. Everything is allowed for me, someone claims, but I will not be enslaved by addiction to anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach is meant for food. But God's going to do away with both of them. Yeah, can imagine? The new body doesn't have a stomach. Okay. It says... So then the body is not intended for sexual vice, but it is really intended for the Lord. For the Lord, the Lord is for the body. Now, just as God has raised the Lord to life from death, so also he'll raise up through the exercise of his power. Now, just as God has raised up the Lord to life from death, he will also raise us up through the exercise of his power. So that's the good news. All of our loved ones who have passed away, they're going to be raised up. We're going to be raised up. And then look at 1 Corinthians 6, 15. 
Do you not realize that your bodies are members making up the body of the anointed one himself? Shall I then take away parts of the body of the anointed one and make them into parts of the body connected to a prostitute? Heaven forbid. And so we go to verse 18 through 20. He says, run, run away from sexual vice. Every other wrong a person does is outside of the body. Sexual vice, however, is a wrong inflicted against a person's own body. Have you not realized that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is inside you, whom you've received from God? Moreover, you are not your own. After all, you've been bought with a price. As a result, you must glorify God in your body. Wow. Uh, I'm, people often say, you ain't the boss of me. You know, well, they say that to God as well. You're not the boss of me. I'll do whatever I want. But we got to realize if we've been bought, we are to house the Lord and we need to keep our body clean. Now, the other thing I want to bring out that's very important in Corinthians, a lot of times Paul, even though this is recorded in the Bible and inspired, he's not telling you what thus saith the Lord. All through, you're going to hear Paul saying, oh, this is what I think, or this is my advice, or here's how I would do it. That doesn't make it the biblical way that it has to be done. He's just giving his advice. You'll see that all through here. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 7, verse 6. He goes, this is what I advise by way of shared accommodation and not by means of a specific commandment. So he's telling you, I'm just giving you my advice. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 12. To the rest, I advise not the Lord that if a brother has a wife who's an unbeliever and she agrees to stay with him, he should not divorce her. Now, again, some people use that as a biblical commandment. No, this is Paul's advice. He tells you it's his advice. In different situations, it could be different. Uh, This is my own personal opinion. If you're in an abusive marriage, be it physical, emotional, any way, get the heck out of there. Run. Don't put up with abuse. Too many people are, they, they go from an abusive person to an abusive person to an abusive person. You know, you, you've got, run. Okay. Um, look at uh, Hebrew, I mean, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 17. He says, only this rule must be followed. Let each one walk according to the assigned purpose the Lord gave to that individual. Wow. Living life according to the call God gave to that person. Moreover, this ruling is what I direct for all the congregations. Okay, this is one of Paul's directives. It's one of his advices. It's one of his things. But uh, I think it's powerful. Everyone should walk according to the assigned purpose the Lord gave to that individual. Because here's the thing. Each one of us are on a different walk. We all, you can't force people to walk your walk. And what God tells you doesn't mean he's also telling the other person that. It could be just because you, because that's your particular problem. But don't you go imposing. The Lord told me that you need to do this. As a matter of fact, look at 1 Corinthians seven nineteen. Whether someone is circumcised.
It's been offered to an idol. You have to understand that's what he's talking about. Okay, and uh, let's see. He says, however, not all possess this knowledge, but some through... Uh, did I? Okay, and I never finished 8, 4 through 6. Okay, he says, Therefore, through the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence. Just like the boogeyman under your bed. It's not real. But if you believe it's real, it's real for you and it has to be dealt with. Okay. He says, there is no God but one, for although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things and from whom we exist, and one Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. So he's just saying, look, we know idols are just dumb idols. But look what happens in verse 7 through 11. He says, however, not everyone possesses this knowledge that there's only one true God. Everything else is just wooden sticks and stupidity. He says, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. He's talking about Gentile believers here, not Jews or Jewish believers, because they're not going to be eating food offered to idols. So here's a guy who's become a believer, but he's eating food offered to an idol. And it says uh, someone else is watching this one Gentile believer eating food offered to idols, and the one who's eating it knows the stupid idol doesn't exist, but the weaker brother who may think those idols are a god or something may get upset because you, as a believer, are eating this clean food. Follow me? I hope, I trust. Okay, it says, for if anyone sees you who have knowledge that there's only one true God, eating in an idol's temple, well, that's not good. You should be going into an idol's temple. It says, will he not be encouraged for his own sake? He might now go and eat food offered to idols. If his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols. And so by your knowledge, this weak person has destroyed the brother for whom Christ died. So this is referring to a former pagan, but again, like I said this morning, you can cause blemishes in other people. I mean, uh, if I were to go visit some immoral place and someone got a video of me visiting some immoral place, okay, that doesn't bode well. You know, and uh, I would never do that anyway, but still, oh my goodness, you don't want to be going into a temple and eating We don't have to worry about that now. We don't have the same situation. We live in a completely different age as far as this goes. But I want you to follow me here. This is incredible. In Revelation 2, 12 through 14. Now, again, that refers to our day. And look at, even though it's speaking at their day, it's also to ours. It says, to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. Okay. Okay. It's coming out of his mouth, it says in Revelation, and it's the word of God. I know where you dwell. You dwell where Satan's throne is. Pergamum was the place where Satan's throne is. And then he says to the Pergamum congregation, yet you hold fast my name and you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But then he says, I have a few things against you, though. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. I think it's fascinating, the last two weeks, last week and this week, it's all about sexual immorality in Leviticus, and then here we're talking about it in the second half. The problem with the food sacrificed to idols, it was off, often tied to sexual immorality because it was all about the fertility goddesses and things like that. So it's how those tie together. Now, Pergamum. Here is Pergamum right here. This is uh, some of the ruins there. Uh, But let me just see something here. Oh, I don't. Do I want to bring this up yet? 
Okay, Pergamum, Pergamum, as you know, is in Turkey, and Corinth is not in Turkey. Uh, I don't, this isn't Pergamum, so let me pause here for a second. Okay, let's see. Okay, so um, I'm going to, I want to show you a couple of things. This is, this is not Pergamum, this is Corinth, Corinth. And they say that ancient Corinth was one of the largest and most important cities of Greece. We're talking about the Corinthians here, so I wanted you to get an idea. It had a population of 90,000 in 400 B.C. That is huge for back then. The Romans demolished Corinth in 146 B.C., and then it was built again in 44 B.C., so when Paul was in Corinth, he was in the rebuilt Corinth. For him back then. Okay. Uh, so, and believe it or not, we're going to go to Corinth. Turkey, agrees, coming up this fall. But let me also show you Pergamum. Here is Pergamum. Okay. Uh, right now it's Bergamum or Bergama in Turkish. But this is a huge ancient site of Pergamum, also often known as Pergamum and called Bergama in Turkish. They say it should win an award for its stunning location alone. I think they said like, I don't know, 20,000 people or something could be seated in this thing. But here's Pergamum again. This is another temple that's in Pergamum. Uh, it says here, adjoining the temple are the ruins of Pergamum's famed library. Listen to this. Built around 170 B.C. This is the time of Hanukkah. 170 B.C., Pergamum was home to one of the largest libraries in the ancient world, had over 200,000 volumes. And they were all carried off to Alexandria by Mark Antony as a gift to Cleopatra. So it had, this was a monstrous library. This is what's left of it that's still in Pergamum. And it says, to the west of the library is the Temple of Trajan. Uh, this must be the Temple of Trajan, built in the Roman era with its marble colonnaded terrace. And then it says, below the theater, you can see the remnants of the great altar, altar of Zeus, dating from the second century BCE. So not only is that there, we also find this ancient red basilica there that some people believe that John could be referring specifically to this grandiose pagan temple as the throne of Satan while others believe it could be referenced to the altar of Zeus right below it. So here, when I'm talking about Pergamum, I want you to know that there's like three different pagan sites that are still there. And again, we're going to go there. So that's going to be one of the places that we're going to be going on our tour. But again, you have to register. So you go to Yosher Tours. Up at the top, it says Mark Blitz Tour. It's really the Mark Bilts Tour. But... Um, Click on that and be sure you register, and they have to have the $1,900 by Tuesday. So I want everyone to come. Yay. Okay, but I wanted you to see how incredible some of these sites are. Pergamum is just one, a phenomenal site, but we'll be seeing almost all of the seven churches, not quite all. Okay, so now let's go back to Micah 6, 1 through 5. It says, Hear ye now what the Lord says, Arise. And contend before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, O mountain, the Lord's controversy. Wow, the Lord's got a controversy. It's got to be with the heathen. It says, be strong, you foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a controversy with his people. And he will plead with Israel, O oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Testify against me. For I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. I redeemed you out of the house of servants. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Here we go. O oh, my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, consulted, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from Shittim unto Gilgal, that you may know the righteousness of of the Lord. Balaam could not curse Israel for Balak, so Balaam taught Balak to get Israel to sin so God himself would curse them. That was the plan. So what did he do? He had him eat food sacrificed to idols and entered into the sexual immorality. Look at Numbers 25, 1 through 3. We'll look at the incident. 
It says, and Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself to Baal Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Okay, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this at the very end. Okay, look at this in Numbers 25, 6 through 9. Behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought to his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle. And Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest sought, rose up from among the congregation. He takes a javelin in his hand. He went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed. And those that died in the plague were 24,000. Okay, here's what happens when they are offering food, sacrifice to idols, and mingling it with immoral sexual activity, and it was with the daughters of Moab. And why is this so bad? Well, guess what? Who did the Moabites worship? The the Moabites worshipped a particular god. Okay, Molech, Chemosh, they would offer their children to Molech. The Moabites and the Ammonites are the ones who would offer their firstborn to the pagan gods. Okay, so now let's look what happens in Psalms 106, 28 through 30. It talks about this incident in Baal Peor. It says they joined themselves also unto Baal Peor and they ate the sacrifices of what? Thus they provoked him to anger with their inventions and the plague broke out on them and they then stood up Phineas, executed judgment and so the plague was stayed. So here Psalms is talking about this incident and they're telling us the food offered to idols were dead people. Look at this next verse. This is in the same context, Psalm 106, 37 and 38. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters to devils. They shed innocent blood, even the blood of their own sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. That's what was going on then. They would offer their kids to an idol and then eat their kids after they were dead. Okay. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 8, 12 and 13. It says, thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you're sinning against the Messiah. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. Okay, so it, what this really comes down to is honoring one another. If you're both believers, I know uh, there are times, uh, let's say somebody wants to take a drink, but they won't drink it with one person because they're an alcoholic and they don't want to offend them and make, get them in trouble. You following what I'm saying? Well, basically what this is saying here is if your brothers and sisters have some proclivity or whatever to do something that's not right, for heaven's sake, help them. Don't make it worse. Okay. And so we go to 1 Corinthians 9, uh, 1 and 2. He says, am I not free? Am I not an authoritative emissary? Have I not seen Yeshua our Lord? Are you not yourselves my work in the Lord? If to others I am no authoritative emissary, at least I am to you. After all, you are the seal of my authenticity concerning my call as an emissary to the Lord. In other words, the Apostle Paul, some say he was an apostle. He made himself an apostle. Well, apostle means sent, and he was sent by God. So in that sense, he's an apostle. And what he's saying to these guys, he's saying, you know, a lot of people may not think I'm an apostle, okay, but... You should at least think of me as one because I was sent to you and now you're our believers. You are my work that the Lord has done through me. Follow? And so look at verse 3 and 8. Paul's having to defend himself. And he says, this is how I defend myself against my critics. Are we without the right to eat and drink? 
do we not have the right to be accompanied by a believing wife like the rest of the emissaries or apostles and the brothers of the Lord as well as Kepha? That's Peter. We know Peter had a wife. Uh, then he says, uh, is Barnabas and I the only ones who have no right to stop working? What soldier serves at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat its grapes? Who shepherds a flock but does not make use of the milk? I am not making these claims according to mere human reasoning. Does not the Torah teach these principles? So what Paul is saying is, look, I am a tent maker. I'm a tents, but there's nothing wrong with the church supporting me so I can continue to do the work in feeding you, right? So look at 1 Corinthians 9, 9 through 12. He says, after all, it stands written in the Torah of Moshe. You must not muzzle the ox while he is threshing grain. Well, God is not concerned only about oxes. Rather, he's speaking for our benefit. It is written for our sake because the one who plows must plow with hope. The one who threshes the grain must hope in sharing the benefit of the harvest. If we sow spiritual blessings into you, is it too much if we reap a material benefit from you? If others claim the right of support from you, we have even more so. Even so, we did not make use of this right. We suffer all things so that we will cause no hindrance against the good news teaching of the anointed one. Okay, so here's my point. Uh, I don't have this uh, on your notes. Most of you are familiar with this, but if you're not, you can write this down. There's an acronym called PARDES, P-A-R-D, and then a little e and an S. That acronym stands for different ways of interpreting the Bible. The P is for Peshat, P-E-S-H-A-T, and it means the plain meaning, uh, meaning of the text. For example, we just read, don't muzzle the ox while he's treading the grain. What do you think that means? Gee, that was hard. Okay, that means the plain meaning of the text. Okay, then there is the R stands for remez, R-E-M-E-Z, and that means a hint that may be another meaning. And that's what Paul is using here. He's going, that may have been a hint to apply to the fact the one who's feeding you should also don't muzzle that person who's feeding you. You follow me? Now, that doesn't replace this, and we can't say, okay, there's a new law in the New Testament. Now we get to muzzle the ox because we're not muzzling the pastor. See, you can't say Christianity is all new and it changes. No, there's levels. The D in Pardes is a drash, uh, which means an allegory. Uh, that's D-R-A-S-H, uh, kind of like how you have Sarah and Hagar compared to the earthly Jerusalem versus the heavenly Jerusalem. Okay, that's a drash. And then the S means sowed, which means things that are hidden. Uh, like in Proverbs 25, 1, it's the glory of God to hide things, and then it's for us to search them out. Okay, final verse here. Here we are. We're at the finish line. Woohoo! We're in a race. It says in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, don't you realize that although every athlete who competes in a race is running, only one receives the prize. Run so that you will win. Every person who competes in the run must exercise self-discipline in some areas, no. in every area of conditioning, they do this to win a perishable wreath of victory, but we do it to receive an imperishable one. As a result, he says, I do not run without a purpose. I fight with all my strength, not like shadow boxing. So then I discipline my body and make it my slave. After I've given teaching to others, I will not allow myself to fall short of reaching the goal. In other words, people need to do what they say, <laughs> especially the instructors, or they're in more trouble. Matthew 5, you know, the teachers are the ones who get in the most trouble. But with that said, let's stand. Father, we just thank you so much for everything that you're doing in all of our lives Lord, I pray that we would be runners, runners, not only running away from immorality, but running toward you with all of our might and all of our strength. Father, we uh, want the light of your Torah to shine in our hearts and reveal any dark areas, Father, because uh, we do want to be a pure, spotless, without blemish uh, bride. 
So, Father, we just thank you for what you're doing in all of our lives. Time is short. And I just pray, Lord, that uh, you'd be speaking to everyone's heart where now is not the time to press the snooze button. Father, wake us all up in Yeshua's name. Amen. As the Lord told Moses to tell Aaron to say this prayer over his people, not only would he bless them, he would put his name upon them. Ivarekeka Adonai Vaishmareka Yaer Adonai Panavileka Vihuneka Yisa Adonai Panavileka Vyasem Laka Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In that wonderful name, Aye Asher Aye. Remember, tomorrow night here on the West Coast, total lunar eclipse, 4 p.m. Paul Bagley on the, his website. See you then, yeah.